And so the question is, is porn, can porn cause an addiction? Well, yes. So long before there were brain scans back in 1930, 1940, 1950, they recognized addiction. You know, they had opium addiction, they had alcohol addiction. You don't have to look into the brain to see an addiction. When you go into a doctor and you're sneezing and it's flu season, they don't need to do a sample and check a virus, they do it by the signs. So the signs and symptoms of an addiction were occurring in these people on the forums. And what are some of the signs and symptoms? Well, here's sort of an easy one that a lot of people use. It's called the four C's. Compulsion to use. And number two is the big one. Continued use in spite of adverse consequences. That really is the definition of addiction. Inability to control use. You know, you're trying to stop, but you just can't. That's another one. And craving, psychological or physical. Now, withdrawal symptoms or tolerance, which is needing a bigger dose to get the same high, they're not part of official diagnosis for most addictions. And the reason I point this out is because the naysayers falsely state that both tolerance, needing greater stimulus, stimulation, and withdrawal symptoms must be present to have a real addiction. And then they take it the step further and they say, well, and porn addicts don't experience tolerance and they don't experience withdrawal symptoms. Well, both of those are false, and especially number two. Here's some of the signs of tolerance, needing greater stimulation. The most common one is escalation to new genres of porn. You escalate and it increases dopamine and arousal, and even if you escalate to something that is really disgusting or previously disgusting, it actually can increase sexual arousal through shock, through surprise. So that's interesting. And so that's the main one, but also searching for the perfect video to end up with, uh, and then you have eventually it affecting you in real life. Now, are there any studies that show this? Well, last year, in the last few months, two studies have come out. Only two studies have asked about tolerance or withdrawal, and guess what they found? tolerance and withdrawal. So this one was just of men who had used porn at least once in the last three months. 49% of them mentioned that at least sometimes searching for sexual content or being involved with porn that they were not previously interested in or that they had considered disgusting. So that's half of porn users, not addicts, half of porn users. And on my site, uh, under uh, that front page article, you'll see about 16 studies that actually point towards escalation. Now, what about withdrawal symptoms? So we've been chronically withdrawal symptoms for a long time on my site. I could just call it YBOP. And these are just some of the withdrawal symptoms. Some people even have physical aches. Some people have nausea. Some even have flu-like symptoms. So it exists. No one has asked about it until just recently, and it was just a couple of months ago. They're putting together a questionnaire. They decided, well, let's have a bunch of questions, and let's look at tolerance and withdrawal. The yellow line is the baseline. Anything above it means you're starting to score in these categories. Here's the problematic porn users, and they score high in tolerance and withdrawal. So the one study that really looked at it closely found it. So that's one for one. So you have to look at something to study it. So we're going to go over the brain changes. And there's really, Nora Volkow and others have said, here's the overarching brain changes. And when naysayers say, well, everything changes the brain. Eating chocolate changes the brain. You know, walking across the street changes the brain. That's irrelevant. There are specific brain changes that are identified over the last 60 years of addiction research that are specific to addiction. So they're not just random brain changes. <clears throat> Sensitization, that's the one where you have hyperreactivity to cues. So if you're a cocaine addict, you go down to the street corner where you used to buy cocaine, all of a sudden you start to shake and you have cravings. Then you have desensitization, and that's where 
your brain lowers the pleasure thermostat. So everything becomes boring except for the addiction. <clears throat> and that leads to tolerance. Hypofrontality means your frontal cortex is weakened and it can't stop you from using. It just becomes weak. And finally, altered stress systems. Your stress system gets altered so that it not only every time you're under stress you have severe cravings, when you stop, your stress system goes into overdrive and you feel really bad. And the only way to feel good is to use again. <laughs> now, if these brain changes could speak, desensitization would be saying, I can't get no satisfaction. Love that song. Altered stress circuits would be saying, well, I need something to take the edge off now. Sensitization would be saying, hey, buddy, I got just what you need to feel you better, feel better. And hypofrontality would be saying, well, yeah, I know it's a bad idea, but there's nothing I can do about it. Here's a nice picture of the reward circuit. I like it. It's pretty. However, it's complex. We're going to use simple. This is a slice down the center of the brain, our simplified reward circuit. And we have to look at this to understand the brain changes very simply. So the reward circuit's activated when we engage in anything that furthers our survival or the survival of our genes. It's always basically choosing moment to moment what you're going to do. Uh, sex is, activates it, eating good food, falling in love, achievement, taking risks, playing, and novelty. And why did I circle novelty? Well, that's what internet porn's about. It's about sexual novelty. So sexual novelty is perhaps the most appealing thing to the basic animal brain, which is the reward circuit. Now, dopamine powers the reward circuit. It's like the gas that provides the engine, and it really powers sexual arousal. There are other neurochemicals, but I'm not going to get into those so much. And it's saying, I've got to have this, no matter what it is. But here's the myth. Dopamine is not pleasure, they think. Dopamine is about wanting. It's about craving. Other neurochemicals are about the awe feeling, the pleasure. The final reward or pleasure is thought to be opioids. You may call them endorphins. They're actually very identical to heroin, morphine, those chemicals, and they're released in our brain. The highest levels of uh, opioids are released at orgasm. It's one of the reasons you know the difference between you know, eating an apple, a little bit of opioids, and having an orgasm, a whole lot of opioids. But what opioids do, once they're released, is they stop us from seeking. You know, here she is in a, a slumber. But this brings up something. The dopamine system is much, much stronger than the opioid system. So the way to think about it, it was we're constantly dissatisfied as humans. You ever feel dissatisfied? You're always looking for something, always wanting something, wanting something. So we're set up to always be dissatisfied. Now that may work fine for animals who can't think about bigger pictures and uh, go into the future, but it's really hard on humans. And what type of, uh, I have a picture of the internet here because the internet really takes hold of the seeking system, of the dopamine system, because it's just endless novelty, endless seeking and searching. So dopamine is really about motivation. It's about seeking reward. So the reward circuit, by a lot of scientists, is actually called the seeking circuit, not the reward, seeking. And of course, what's more important for all organisms than seeking reproduction? And to that end, the highest level of dopamine that we can have naturally is through sex and orgasm. And all, as I mentioned before, all potentially addictive elevate dopamine in different parts of the reward circuit. But back to the um, internet. So of course, we're watching porn. Sex, highest level of dopamine. I get bored with that, 
video. Well, now I'm going to click on something new. Novelty. Oh, sexual novelty. Hi, hi. But there's even more than just sexual novelty that can keep dopamine elevated. And this is important because the core beginning of addiction is high dopamine in the reward system. Searching and seeking. So if you're constantly seeking, you're on a tube site, next video, next video, you're seeking for the next one, seeking for the best, the best one. Anticipation. So right before you click, a little squirt of dopamine. Shock and surprise. There's a reason why we gravitate towards scary movies, if you do, or roller coasters, is because they increase dopamine. It's not exactly enjoyment, but we want it. And finally, anxiety. Most people don't know this, but anxiety can increase dopamine, and it can also increase adrenaline. It can increase cortisol, and all of those activate the reward system. So over and over, guys say, you know, I just couldn't, you know, lesbian wasn't enough, and I'm on to rape porn. And why they end up on rape porn? Because it was shocking, it was surprising, and it increased anxiety, and their reward system was so numbed and used to the old porn, this is the only way they could get their lagging reward circuit back up and get sexually aroused. Hear that story a million times. So in essence, unlike real sex, you can control your arousal, you can control your dopamine levels with a mouse. And so this hasn't been done prior to 2006. You know, there was dial up and then there was Kazaa. And finally, the guys, I say guys because that's mostly what we deal with, they had tube sites where you have free streaming porn. And now the speeds are tremendous and it's all HD. So you can put up 20 tabs and just keep clicking on these two minute videos and never finish a, minute, a video. And just an aside, Many guys who came down, like guys in their 50s who came down with porn-induced ED, they've been using porn all their life since they're 15. A, a year of tube sites and all of a sudden they couldn't get an erection. Tube sites change the game. It sets you up so that, oh my God, I need all this level of stimulation to be aroused, and then I get with a real partner, boing, nothing. Dead as a doorknob. So we're going to get into the first brain change, sensitization. So dopamine isn't, has a message. It's telling your brain. So if you're out searching for food and you're a hunter-gatherer and you go to a tree and you eat some of the apples and my goodness, that's really good. Well, dopamine is squirting and it's helping you remember. It's helping you remember where that tree was so you can go back to, to get it again. Well, dopamine says this activity is really good. Remember it. And please. Do it again because it's necessary for your survival. Dopamine is for remembering and repeating a behavior. It's not about pleasure. So as the dopamine levels are high, let's say you're on a two-hour session of going through uh, 100 videos, it starts to, and here's where you hear about rewiring, it actually rewires, makes connections, and connects all the events associated with your addiction, whether it's cocaine, whether it's watching porn, and then it creates a pathway. It creates a very powerful pathway that can blast the reward center with high levels of activation, making cravings. So that any type of cue, turning on your computer, pop-ups, name of your porn site, actually activates the brain and releases sometimes higher dopamine than the addiction itself. Get that. The before I'm going to use can often release higher dopamine than the act of taking the drug or engaging in your behavior. So that's overwhelming to the system and it's hard to ignore and your primitive brain thinks you're doing something to keep yourself alive necessary for survival. It feels like that. And of course, the analogy that's often used is creating these pathways. You know, you go through a, a field and if you take it quite a few times, you eventually create a pathway of least resistance. 
And now you have a preferred pathway with porn for sexual arousal, escape, relief, whatever you want to name it. And this is the core addiction change. This is where everything starts with addiction. Then you ask, well, are there any studies that have found sensitization in porn users? Uh, there's 19. So the core addiction change has been found in 19 studies published in the last few years. So there's plenty of science to back up the core addiction change. And I also, uh, on my research page, I made it even easier where I put the four addiction changes and then I listed uh, the studies and you can click on them that show that particular change in case you ever get into a debate with anyone or are bored on a Saturday night to nerve cells in the same way. Both sensitization and sexual conditioning rewire the brain to want it, to crave it, whatever it is. Let's go in depth with sensitization. Using porn as the example, sensitization occurs when the brain wires together the sights, sounds, smells, sensations, emotions, and memories associated with a big reward, such as masturbating to porn, creating a pathway that can blast our reward center in the future. When activated by cues or triggers, this pathway creates powerful, hard to ignore cravings. For example, simply turning on the computer might activate sensitized pathways. So might a sidebar picture on a popular news site. Here are two guys describing sensitization at work. Guy one, relapsed to porn once, and even though I didn't get fully erect, I could not believe the intensity of the rush I got when I clicked to the site. Very powerful excitation, tingling, dry mouth, and even trembling. Guy two, it's like being possessed by a porn crazed demon, and then once you're finished, your real self returns and wonders what the hell just happened and why you just wasted all this time. End quote. Sensitization is a unique and powerful form of Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning that alters the reward circuit, both structurally and chemically. Instead of salivating to the sound of the bell, your reward circuit now fires up in anticipation of internet porn. So we know sensitization begins with high levels of dopamine, which tells your primitive brain that this activity is really, really valuable and you should do it again and again. And nothing's more important to your primitive brain than spreading your genes, even if your higher brain knows it's just a screen. Dopamine's ultimate goal is to have us remember and repeat what furthers our gene survival. Dopamine does this by triggering the production of a protein called Delta Fos B. Whether it's drugs or natural rewards, chronically high levels of dopamine can lead to the accumulation of Delta Fos B. This image shows how Delta Fos B accumulates with chronic overconsumption. What's unique about Delta Fos B is that it hangs around in the brain for about eight weeks after your last binge. Delta Fos B activates certain genes that begin to change the brain. As Delta Fos B levels rise, it rewires the brain to want it, whatever it is. This can create a circular process of wanting leading to doing and more surges of dopamine, which triggers the production of more Delta Fos B and the cycle continues. So it's really Delta Fos B that creates sensitization and it does this by building stronger, more powerful nerve connections. Here's an important point. Long after an addict has quit using and Delta Fos B levels have returned to normal, these sensitized addiction pathways still remain. This explains why alcoholics who have been sober for years can experience strong cravings by simply walking into a pub. Sensitization and other forms of learning are governed by this simple principle, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Here's a picture of three nerve cells connected. The top two are communicating and firing together. In this simplified model, the first nerve cell might be your favorite porn star while the second nerve cell would be in the reward center. Look at where the arrow is pointing. The number of nerve connections is about to increase. There are now more connections, along with chemical changes, that facilitate communication. When a memory or cue activates your favorite porn star nerve cells, your reward center nerve cells are blasted with impulses, which you experience as cravings to watch porn. 
This mechanism is at work whether it's cues for a gambling addiction or for a cocaine addiction. This process is analogous to walking through a field of grass. The more often you take the path, the easier it becomes. Eventually porn can become the path of least resistance or even the preferred pathway for both sexual arousal and entertainment. Forming new brain pathways falls under the umbrella term neuroplasticity. This is how we learn and how we become addicted. Another form of neuroplasticity involves weakening of old brain pathways. Examples include forgetting most everything you learned in high school and breaking a bad habit. Sometimes we lump these two together and just simply call it rewiring the brain. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. Neuro is for neuron or nerve cell, and plasticity means plastic in the sense of malleable, changeable, adaptable. Here is the book on neuroplasticity, the number one bestseller, The Brain That Changes Itself, by psychiatrist Norman Doidge. He treated a lot of men with porn-induced ED and porn-induced fetishes. Quote from the book, the current porn epidemic gives a graphic demonstration that sexual taste can be acquired. Pornography, delivered by high-speed internet connections, satisfies every one of the prerequisites for neuroplastic change. Describing his patients, Doidge continues, The men at their computers looking at porn were uncannily like the rats in the cages at the NIH, pressing the bar to get a shot of dopamine or its equivalent. Though they didn't know it, they'd been seduced into pornographic training sessions that met all the conditions required for plastic change of brain maps, end quote. But Norman Doidge was treating older men who had years of real sex before the internet came along. The adolescent brain is far more plastic than an adult's brain, and it is primed to wire up to sexual cues in order to successfully reproduce later on. Before the internet, what would a 13-year-old boy fantasize about when masturbating? Maybe making out with a girl in his class? If it was the 70s, maybe feeling up Farrah Fawcett, all age appropriate. Today, a 13-year-old's imagination is replaced by hardcore streaming videos of people engaged in all sorts of crazy stuff. None of it is age appropriate and little of it resembles real sexual encounters. Let's visualize the fire together, wire together principle at work in a 13-year-old boy just discovering tube sites. Adding internet porn into the mix creates two competing sexual pathways, porn in yellow and real in white. Sure, Jessica in algebra is cute, but if a 13-year-old is masturbating every day to gang bangs, cream pies, or hente, the Jessica pathways will have a hard time keeping up. Here's why. He's not masturbating to thoughts of Jessica, but to porn. His brain is constantly reinforcing the stimuli he associates with masturbation and ejaculation. The sensitized porn pathway is now the preferred pathway because it leads to a bigger reward than the real pathway. The white line representing real people is dotted because disuse can weaken it. Norman Doidge summarizes, because plasticity is competitive, the brain maps for new, exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them. End quote. Whether we call it brain maps, or sensitized porn pathways, or sexual conditioning, or this is what turns me on, it all comes down to training the brain to expect sexual arousal under specific conditions. With internet porn, these conditions include being alone, sitting in a chair, voyeurism rather than participation, continuously searching and seeking for the next hit of dopamine, constant novelty with each click, multiple tabs each with a three minute video, shock and surprise to maintain arousal, new genres to overcome boredom, multiple porn stars per session or per video, fetishes of every imaginable and unimaginable type. While this type of sexual conditioning is far more powerful during adolescence, it can occur at any age. So whether you are 22 or 52, the disparity between real sex and masturbating to internet porn is a major factor in both porn-induced erectile dysfunction and other sexual problems and the inability to quit using porn. Sensitized porn pathways light up for 
one type of experience, yet real sex is a completely different kind of experience. Many with porn-induced fetishes or porn-induced ED need to not only stop using porn, they also need to rewire their sexual arousal to real partners. To summarize, both sensitization and sexual conditioning appear to involve the same reward center changes with Delta Fos B playing a major role. The name of the study, Natural and Drug Rewards Act on Common Neuroplasticity Mechanisms with Delta Fos B as a Key Mediator. 2013, the natural reward here is sex. Quote from the study, Natural and drug rewards not only converge on the same neural pathway, they converge on the same molecular mediators and likely the same nerve cells to influence the wanting of both types of rewards. End quote. This means that cravings for addictive drugs or for porn tap into the same mechanisms and brain circuits. And recent brain studies on porn addicts support this. Feel free to read the titles. These two studies were by addiction neuroscientists at Cambridge University. Both studies compared carefully screened porn addicts to control groups and found sensitization in the porn addicts. Compare the two rows. The porn addicts reward centers lit up when exposed to porn, far more than normal healthy controls and as the headline says, just like the brains of drug addicts do when they are exposed to drug related cues and triggers. Another headline. Anyhow, the Cambridge studies found even more similarities with drug addiction. Quote, sexual desire or subjective measures of wanting appear disassociated from liking in line with incentive salience theories of addiction in which there exists enhanced wanting but not liking of salient rewards. Translation, porn addicted subjects aligned with the accepted model of addiction called incentive sensitization. That is, they experienced strong wanting and cravings to use porn, yet they did not like it any more than non-addicts, or as some would say, wanting it more, liking it less, yet never really satisfied. Another quote from one of the studies, porn addicted subjects reported that as a result of excessive use of sexually explicit materials, they experience diminished libido or erectile function specifically in physical relationships with women, although not in relationship to the sexually explicit material." End quote. Not only did their brains look like drug addicts, but 60% of the subjects, average age 25, had porn-induced erectile dysfunction or porn-induced low libido. This completely dismantles the claim that compulsive porn users simply have higher sexual desire rather than an addiction. If you can get a boner for porn, but not for real flesh and blood partners, you don't have high libido. Up till now, we've been exploring the shared mechanisms behind sensitization and sexual conditioning. However, you can condition your sexual arousal to internet porn, uh, experience porn-induced sexual problems, or porn-induced fetishes and yet not be addicted. We are seeing this more and more. As mentioned, addiction involves many more brain changes than just sensitization.